Right, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask that you turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 16, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. Matthew 16, and beginning in verse 13. The Bible says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of the heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you give us on an everyday basis. Lord, we praise you for that. Lord, we praise you for breath of life this morning, for the food that we eat. And Lord, more than that anything, Lord, we praise you for your word. Lord, we pray that you might open it to us today. Lord, that you might send the Holy Spirit this way, Lord, and that you might uh, minister unto us, Lord, that you would encourage us in the things that we now do and the places where and the time that we live, Lord, we need that. Lord, we pray now that you would honor your word according to your mercy and grace, we pray it. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning on some things, what Christ means to me. Now, a lot of times when we think of the person of Christ, uh, we really don't think of the things he did, the things that he accomplished. Uh, most of the time, and it is true, most of the time we really think of him as a sufficient sacrifice. And he is, but he's so much more than that. Uh, he did so much more than that. He accomplished so much more than that. And, and, we, uh, uh, and, and we must realize that. Now going back to our text verse, the Bible says, And when Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and I want you to see that as he begins to reveal himself, it's always at a specific time and a specific place. Uh, he reveals himself when he's ready. Now, he, he came to this place and he began to teach his disciples. And he asked his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, I want you to, I want you to know two things. There is an idea about Christ among most people. Now, there are some that have never heard the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be a missionary. I wouldn't be interested in spreading the gospel if I thought everybody had done heard of Jesus. Really, what would be the point? But I believe there are unreached, un, untold people, and so we continue to preach the gospel. Um, another thing concerning the, what the men call Christ... Many look at it as just as something to use when you need it. Something to fall back on when there's nothing else to do. If you get in trouble, if illness raises its head, if it's a death in the family, or something along those lines, then and only then did they fall on the person of Christ. Uh, a lot of people say during 9-11, the attacks on our nation, that we went back to our knees. And I'll have to disagree with that. I believe there was a form of godliness, but I really believe they denied the power thereof. And if they, because if they had not, it would continue. It, it, it would be an ongoing revival. But after about a month or so, people had forgot everything was returned to normal. Nothing uh, really continuing uh, along those lines. And so I want you to see that there has always been an idea of man about Christ. And there's always been the revealed truth of Christ. There's always, and in history itself says that there was a man named Jesus. And knowing that fact is not revealed truth. 
truth. It, it isn't what the essence of the gospel is about. And so they do ask, uh, they do answer him, who, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, and they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elisha, and others Jeremiah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now it is significant that these men said that because both Elijah and Elijah and Jeremiah had very specific roots in the ministry. Elijah was very confrontational, or he could be he could be persuaded that way or presented that way because he called sin sin. He was not a compromiser. That's why he went against 400 prophets of Baal. He was not a compromiser. So the first thing you can say about Jesus is he's no compromiser. Jeremiah, his whole thing was judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Judgment's on its way. Get ready. Judgment is coming. And then, being a true prophet after judgment came in the book of Lamentation, he wasn't rejoicing. He was grieving over the fact they would not listen. His prophecy came true, and he wasn't going, Woo! I told you so. He wept over the destruction of Israel. That's a true preacher. He's not excited about the judgment of sin. He's not excited when, when things fall out uh, to the misery of many people, but he has a loving heart. And so they describe him this way, and the last comparison they made, well, he, he could be John the Baptist. And the reason they thought maybe he was John the Baptist is because he adhered to what John said. Repent ye. You know, if you if you follow the gospel in, in, in Matthew, uh, John presents, he says, repent ye. And the very first message that the Lord Jesus preached was repent ye. And that's why, well, maybe, maybe they're the same because they preach the same things. Maybe, maybe that's who it is. And so I want you to see that men can think one thing about Jesus and the reality being something so, so different. And then verse 15, he asked a different question. He said, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Now he was addressing the apostles. Uh, the only the only known saved people, I believe some of, I believe Mary Magdalene and, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and some of those others were saved, but in a teaching sense, he was talking to the core group, the church, and he says, Who do ye say that I am? And Peter is the only one that answered. Or at least that's the only documented we have. What do you think Thomas may have said? What do you think? Judas may have said. We just have that one document. The only one that we know answered for sure was Peter. And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And he says, Blessed are thou, Simon Berjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but how? But my Father in heaven. That is how revealed Christ comes. Now, uh, we don't need to get hard shell about that, and we need to continue to preach the gospel, but you always remember that the fact that Jesus is the Christ is a revealed truth, and it's handed to you by the mercy of God. No other thing does that, no other ability. If you're saved and you know Christ is Christ, it's a revealed truth. And, and we, need, we need to hold it as precious. We need to hold it as and something dear and, and, and something uh, valuable in our life. And many times we do not do that. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Bejoda, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, I've heard this taught in different ways, and it ought not to be. I, I, I've heard somebody say, he said, Thou art Simon Berjona, and on this rock, pointing back at... The only problem is, it doesn't say that he pointed, did it? And adding anything to the Bible is always wrong. Adding anything to the Word of God. So what I believe about this, he says, Thou art Simon 
Jonah. That is a true, valid statement. We know he was called Rock. We know who he was. And, he, and he, then he says, Thou art Simon Jonah. And on this rock, a, a fact so simple as my name is Larry, he built his church on. He built his church on truth. Nothing more, nothing less. Simple, revealed truth. And, and that's really all that we can take from this verse is that he, will be, he, he began his church on truth. I also want you to see that nothing will take the church down. Nothing will, will obliterate the church. Churches come and go, but there will always be a church adhering to truth somewhere, at some place throughout history. It will always be just that way. And then he says, and I, and I will give thee, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, Watch out, Catholic people, when you when they read this, because they will say Peter was the first pope because he had the keys. Now, what is the key to heaven? Well, and it says plural keys. Man. Is it not? Man. Number one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number because he was the sacrifice. Number two. Is the revealed truth that He was Christ. And that is an act of God. The Holy Ghost can only accomplish that. That is a key to heaven. We have the atonement. We have the revealed truth that, that He is God. And we have the glorious gospel. The good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. To spread throughout all the world. Those are the keys to the kingdom. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing that can be said. Okay, the church is the key to heaven. And Catholics will pull that out of there every time. But I will give you this. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on heaven shall be... Excuse me. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, a lot of people will, will say, well, that's when you exclude people out of the church. I'm not too sure about that. I, I will say this. I believe we can discipline people from the church. But I do not believe we can we can throw them out. And the reason why, who put them in? Who put people in the church? God puts people in the church. I have placed some in the church, first apostles, secondary teachers. And, and he put them in the church. So how how are you going to undo an act of God? If you take that, if you take that idea too far, pretty soon you'll be. Losing your salvation because you're maintaining it. And you will be giving salvation to someone else because you can do it. We can't take away the attributes of Almighty God. So that one portion of the verse, I pray for understanding. But I'm not sure I understand it the way I need to yet. But I do know this, Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer to all. And when you begin to look at His ministry in detail, all the things that He accomplished, the, the way that He presented Himself, it went far beyond than being the sacrifice. That was the ultimate thing. That's the reason He came. But have you ever thought of the reasons, the reasons that He came? Now, I want you to look with me back, if you will, in... In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8. Now when you begin to see the Lord Jesus Christ act and move, it's really along this time. Before that, He was a servant. Before that, He was under His Father's tutelage. And now, uh, and now we find Him being something so much more than that. We find Him being uh, something different and, and something and something great and something and something marvelous. He begins to do works in the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew eight verse six. The Bible says, "Saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented." And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. 
And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Drop down to verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so it will be done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Jesus is a healer. Jesus is a healer. We all we, we need to remember that all through his, in fact, if you follow the Gospel of Matthew, eleven times he's noted as the healer. Eleven different times his work that he was doing on that moment was healing. And many, many times it wasn't just one individual that he healed. Many of the times it was, it was documentation that hundreds were healed under the sound and the work of his voice. And, and to reduce him today to the inability that he can no longer heal is taking from his ministry. Now I'll say this, can we demand that he heals nothing. Nothing farther. You know what? You can't demand God to do nothing. That, that, that's an inability of man. We, we can't make demands on God. But we certainly... But what did the centurion do? He came and asked. And he believed it was possible. That, that's all he did. He came and asked and believed. If we want a divine healing today... My suggestion to you is ask and believe. Right. That, that, that's, all, that's all we can do. Ask and believe. And so we see a huge portion of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry here on earth. The thing that He did was to heal sickness. Now drop down to verse 14. And when Jesus was coming to, unto Peter's house, He saw His wife's mother laid sick of a fever... And he touched her, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. Again, a divine healing. Uh, 8.16. 8.16. We see another ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ had. And uh, the Bible says, and when the Bible says, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick. Again, we find divine healings administered by Christ. And then we go for a step further, and we find that devils, little devils, those, those angels cast from, from the glories of heaven because of rebellion, because he is above them, he cast them out. That was part of his ministry. I mean, it, it ought to be exciting and thrilling to us that our Jesus is great and more powerful than any one of those devils that were cast out, including Lucifer himself. He, he's above that. They, they, they have to submit. If he says go, they have to go. When, when, he, when he approached Legion, those many, many demons that was within that man, every one of them was in submission. That, that, that's a marvel to me. And you know what? We see some things today that, that scare us. We see some things that is upsetting in this world. Listen, I have seen people I know within my heart, even in caring for the sick, that I know they were demon possessed. That, that is not a, a, just a Bible year's teaching. It still happens. I, I would be willing to say many... Many politicians are full of devils. They are full of devils. I would say all abortionists are full of devils. They are full of devils. You know what the, you know what the remedy is? The remedy is Christ. It always has been. It always will be. But can you imagine? Can imagine? Now I will say this. The Bible says, everybody says He put on flesh... Well, the Bible actually says that He put on the likeness of flesh. He put on the form of flesh. I do not believe He literally was flesh because if He had been, He would have been sinful. Right? Well, where do we get our sin from? Do we not get our sin, our nature, from our parents? 
I think he was no more Mary's than he was Joseph's. I think he, Mary was simply used as a vessel to nurture him to the time he came. That's all I believe. That I, I, I believe because, and so we see this man that comes in the likeness of sinful flesh, that he has the power and dominion over devils. Now let me say this one more time. In his wonderful power over the devils, no other man has that. And you know why? Because they are just as fleshly as anybody else. If it's the Pope, if it's holiness people, or whatever label you want to put on that, they do not have the power. Now they can go before the Lord and ask, you be very careful when you start demanding a devil to do anything. Remember Simon the sorcerer? Remember the man that had seven sons? I think it was named son. It was something tedious or something like that. And he said, Peter I know, and Christ I know, but who are you? So he did not have the power to do that. And, and, and so we see then that our Lord Jesus, not only did He heal the sick multiple, multiple times, showing that He is ruler over illness, He showed also that He had power over devils. He had, you know what? He even has power over Satan, Lucifer himself. And I'll give you this, this is how I know it. He says, give me hence, Satan, because thou art a fence unto me. And you know what the Bible says Satan left him for a season. He's under his dominion. That's a very powerful being, is it not? Christ is a very, a very wonderful, powerful entity that ought to be worshipped just for that. So we see that he's a healer. And he also has authority over devils. Matthew 9, chapter 2. Oh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. Matthew 9, verse 2. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy. And I don't know exactly what their idea of palsy was, but Anna, our adopted daughter, has a palsy. She's unable to move. She's unable to do for herself. Lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now I want you to see, in addition to having dominion over devils, and in addition to having dominion over illness, we find here he has dominion over sin. He can forgive sin. You know what? A lot of people say, well, He was the atonement for sin. Listen, He was so much more than the atonement of sin. He had the power. That word power means authority. Amen. He had the authority to say, thy sins be forgiven thee. Amen. That's what He said. He said that to the thief on the cross. Today thou will be with me in paradise. You know what another authority He has? He has people, he has the authority to place people in the abode of God. He says, today we will be with me in paradise. You know what? Jesus ought to be worshipped. He ought to be lifted up. Everybody says, uh, and it's true, he's just our ad, he's our advocate with the Father. And that's true. He's our avenue. He's our, you know what? That's why a lot of people don't even realize that that's why we pray in Jesus' name. We don't pray in other names. We pray in the name of Jesus. But in addition to that, He can do so much more. He ought to be worshipped. When we come down to this house, we ought to lift up the name of Jesus because He, he deserves worship. You think about when, when on, on the week before the crucifixion, how they came and laid and laid those palm leaves before the person of Christ, and they were saying, "Hallelujah, He's coming, He's here," and they worshipped Him. That's the way, that, that is true worship. Now they did it for the wrong reasons, but that's worship, is it not? Putting Jesus high, lifting Him up—that that is worship 
to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that he also is a forgiver of sins. I love Matthew 11 verse 1. We find so much that Christ is. Matthew 11 verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples. He departed thence to teach and to preach in the cities. Now I want you to see he did a number of things here. Number one, he's a commander. Do you see that? And when he had finished commanding his twelve disciples. You know what? It ought not that he makes a request of you. He makes a demand of you. That's a commander. You, yes, sir. I'll get the job done. In other words, you know, and even to the point, thank you for giving me something to do. Thank you for making me a vehicle that, the, cry, that the, the gospel may be spread. Thank you for using me in the way that you did. But instead we balk and we snap and I ain't going to do it. And that really ain't of God. You know what? We ought not to doubt the message of the Holy Ghost. But we do, do we not? Oh, I'm not sure about that. I may be getting a little emotional. Well, you know what? God made us emotional beings, did He not? And, and, and so we find here that, that we find that the Lord is commander. In other words, He's the ruler. He, he, he barks out the, order, the orders and we ought to obey them. He's commanding the twelve disciples. And then it says He departed thence to teach. He was a teacher. He was a teacher as much as He was a preacher. Uh, you, you, can, you can just read... Uh, even on the, the Sermon on the Mount. If you, you know on the Sermon on the Mount what the Bible says. He sat down to teach them. It did not say that he preached to them. He sat down to teach them. It said that he sat down. And there's nothing wrong with it. But when the, the preaching service and the teaching service is here. What does the person do? All three of us stand. Do we not? You know, I wonder if he sat down to teach to say, hey, I'm on your level. I'm with you, and I want to engage you, and I want you to tell you who I am. And he gave them at least five glorious lessons from on the mountain. Now that ought to be that that ought to be a wonderful thing to us. He's a teacher. And, and then we ought to carry it over. When Paul is giving the church at Thessalonica the qualifications of a bishop or a preacher, what was the first thing? Apt to teach. You know what? If a, if a man of God cannot teach the word of God, my idea is that he's not much of a preacher either. Because that is a qualification, is it not? Apt to teach. Give him the hospitality. And me and Don nail our door shut and say, you ain't coming in here. That disqualifies me. Does it not? I think it does. We have a place. You know what? One time, we had two families visiting us from, Mich I mean, from Ohio. One of them had seven children. And the other one had seven children. Or eight. Eight, I think. And plus, at that time, we had seven children. We found a place for every one of us to lay. That, that, that's how given you ought to be. We all slept and got up and we all ate. And so we see then that our Lord Jesus Christ, He's a commander, He's a teacher. And then lastly, it says in verse 1, and a preacher and to preach. You know what? There is a difference. Everybody wants to say, well, there's no real difference. Yes, there is a difference in teaching and preaching. There is a huge difference. You know what? When, when the gospel is preached, people are saved. There is a difference between teaching and preaching. And listen, if anybody tells you any different, they're not, it's not so. I've never been to a Russellite meeting. But I know a lot of people that have. And they just sit around and kind of discuss things. Got a cousin who's a Russellite. He told me the same. And, and he's big up in it, so I guess he'd know. You know what? When I, when I am at a service myself, I want to hear some preaching. Do you not? Do you just want to sit around and talk about things? 
Nothing wrong with that, but I want to hear some preaching too. So we find that he's a commander. That means he's in control. He says, you go there, and you go there, and you go over there. He's a commander. He's a teacher. And he was a marvelous preacher of the gospel. That, that, that is what our Lord Jesus Christ did. We ought to rejoice in that. We ought to, we ought to give him praise and glorify him. And, and be thrilled at the very thought of what he done for us. Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verse 34. Matthew 15, verse 34. The Bible says, And Jesus said unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down in the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fishes. And gave thanks and broke them. And gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. You know what Jesus is? He's a provider. He is a provider. He gives us what we need. Now, he ain't going to give you what you want. A lot of us want to, to pull that in. But he is going to give you what you need. You know what? I, I've seen, in, in, in me and Donna's life, I've seen the pantry get pretty low. But I've not seen it bare yet. You know what? He's a provider. He gives us what we need. Every time. And you know what? You know this story as well as I. Who did they feed first? Their guest. They fed the guests. You know, there, there's a wonderful teaching in that. It ought to be that when someone comes into your house, you serve them. Whatever you have. I remember when it, back in the 70s, you know, they looked back at that time when we were all living and I was just a kid, but they called it a recession in the economy. Y'all remember that? Some of you, some of you weren't born yet. Now they're looking back on it and they're calling it a depression. And the reason they didn't cause a, a depression then, they didn't want mass panic in our United States because we remember they remembered the 30s. And they knew what it was all about. And so they called it a recession. And you know what? Even in that, we always had something to eat. Sometimes it was bread, cornbread, beans, and potatoes, but we had something to eat. The whole time. And I remember my grandmother. We stayed with her a whole lot. Especially after my grandfather got sick. And even little hobos would come up. Because listen. It, it was hard times. People didn't realize then how hard it was. But it was rough times. Especially 72, 73, 74. Along in there. And my nanny would always give something to those men. Now she would make them eat on the porch. And she would never ever give them money. But she would put something together and give them a plate of food. You know what? The Bible says we've entertained angels unaware. Amen. And so we see then that our Lord Jesus Christ is a provider. So the next time you get stressed out, and listen, when, when they say, listen, if you keep worshiping where you're worshiping, if you keep preaching what you're preaching, listen, we won't let you. Let your money, your retirement flow through the electronic lines. Remember this, that I told you that He is a provider. Something will come from somewhere because He's able. He's a provider. We want to give Him praise and glory and honor. Matthew 16, verse 7. Excuse me. Matthew 16, verse 17. We've seen that He's a revealer. We, we read that earlier. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He is a revealer. He reveals truth. You know what? It's a glorious and marvelous thing when He reveals the fact that you're lost. That you are hopeless and helpless and you need a Redeemer. That is a revealed truth. It is not a common truth. It is a revealed truth. And when He reveals the fact that there is an answer to sin, that's a revealed truth. What does the Bible say? Come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know what? Most of us, uh, 
not everybody always has a burden. You know what the burden and the heavy laden is? It's your own sin. Everybody says, oh, he'll be a comfort. And he is a comfort to you. But listen, that ain't, that ain't being down and out about a storm coming. That ain't being down and out about because you don't have enough to eat. It's being burdened down with your own sin. And he's a reviewer of that burden. If your salvation consists of anything less than that, certainly I would make my calling and election sure and want to be sure that I am exactly where I believe I am. Look with me, uh, Matthew 17, verse 7. And Jesus said, uh, and Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. You know what else he is? He is a reliever. He is a revealer of truth, and he's also a he is a reliever of fears. Every one of us, if we'd be honest, we would say we have been fearful of something. It may have been a real risk. It may have been something that we conjured up in our minds. But you know what? He is a reliever of fears. And ain't it a wonderful thing that I am not fearful of hell? Everybody says, oh, that's being prideful. No, it's not. Because I am depending on the mercy and the goodness and the sufficiency of Christ. Why should I fear hell? You know what? I used to hear old Garner Smith say, I, I, I trust the Lord so much, I would swing out over a hell on a dry corn stalk. And you know what? I'm about there with Him now. He is such a, a, he is such a provider. Why should we think He, he, he relieves our fears? He, he's the eye of the storm, is He not? He's a reliever. He gives us relief and, and, and encouragement when no one else can. Whenever Job's wife came up and said, My suggestion is curse God and die. Who do you think encouraged him? Who, who do you think brought him along the way? Was it not the Lord? Sure it was. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 2. Matthew 24, and verse 2, the Bible says, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things, meaning the building of the temple? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, another thing that our Lord Jesus was, He was a prophet. He warned them of judgment to come. He knew the future. He was a prophet. He knew what was going to happen. The very events, all of you know that He's speaking of, didn't happen for 70 years. But He knew it was going to happen. You know why? He was a prophet. He knew the future. Isn't it a wonderful thing? Why do we fret? Why do we worry? We know the man and serve the man that knows the future. He can tell the future. And you know why? He wrote it. He knows what it's all about. He, 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 does, it, he does it because he constructed it and he understands it. He is a prophet of things to come. And we ought to give him praise and glory for that. Drop down to verse 31. And, ye sh and he shall send angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. He's a prophet. He knows about the catching away. He knows we'll be removed from this place. One, one glorious day. Matthew 26. 26. Excuse me. 26. 50, 26. 36. Let me get it right. Gospel of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto him, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Another thing that our Lord Jesus Christ was, he was a prayer. 
He sought the face of God in everything he did. You know, what, what a wonderful thing if we could be that way. That everything that, that was set before us, we just laid it out before God and said, you know what, I need to know what to do. He prayed three separate times just on this occasion. And if you follow the Gospel of Luke, every time he prayed was for a whole hour. So three hours during that night, he spent in prayer. I dare say that we've never done that. I know I have. I, I, know, I, I can say for me, because I know I have. I, I never prayed for three hours. On the, e on the evening before the morning of selecting the apostles, the Bible says he prayed all night. And you know what? I don't know what he was praying about. I don't know if he was praying for their well-being. I don't know if he was praying for their strength. I don't know if he was praying... I've got, to I, I've got to select Judas. I've got to pick a devil out of the crowd to be with me. You know what? That's something to pray about, is it not? I, I, you know what? You don't know how many demons and devils you faced every day. We like to think we know the people we work with, don't we? Listen, you do not. We like to even think we know the people we live with. But we don't. Not really. My, my wife has a good testimony of salvation. But you know what? I can't answer for her and she can't answer for me. We better know what we know what we know. Amen. And so we see that our Lord was a prayer warrior in addition to all else that He did. He always took time to go before the Lord Jesus Christ and to, I mean, God the Father, and to pray for what His will would be. Last place, Matthew 28, verse 18. Matthew 28 and verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came, came and spake unto them, and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The last thing, and a lot of people, and I understand what they're saying, says that word means authority. And he definitely had authority. But you know what else? He had power. He had strength. He had might. Listen, you talk about uh, an entity. You talk about you talk about a deity that can say, Peace, be still. And the storm clouds go away. And the sea becomes calm. You know what? That's a powerful individual. You know what? Someone that can come across walking on the sea. That's a powerful individual. You know what? Somebody... They did not take Jesus' life. Don't ever be duped into that. He gave it. And you know why? Because He's powerful. He's a very powerful entity. We, we really can't grasp how powerful Christ is. And, and the reason why, a lot of times, and listen, I, I don't know how they're all in one and yet different, but we really want to give that power to God Jehovah, don't we? But you just remember that Christ is just as powerful. He's just as powerful. He can do all things. Whatever He chooses to do, whatever He wants to do.